The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello, and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and the guests are joining me here today to deep dive into air wealth, One started out in the pensions department for British Airways, Mm, interesting, before diving into a three-decade-long adventure of introducing new tech solutions to the wealth management industry. And the other, while studying, he also worked part-time for an advice firm that is actually part of the broader ensemble family. Hello, Eva Lesko of Financial Services. And despite being the youngest guest we have had, also has a passion for vintage watches and vinyl records. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Ray and Dan. Tubman, Woo! welcome, welcome. Thanks, Thanks Peter. Thanks for having us. Not at all. No, at, well, you. and I should mention first father son guests. So that's pretty. We've had brother sister. Now we've Brilliant. had father son. Good work, team. <laughs> Intergenerational. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the word we all hear all the time, right? At the moment, intergenerational wealth. Um, exactly. If nobody's picked up on that in advice, then they're just not listening hard enough, are they? It's it's full on. So very true. I'm really keen to get a really good understanding of the app. But first, I'd just like to take a moment to ease us in a little, get to know you through your use of technology. So, let's start with emojis. What are your most used emojis? You know, do you use emojis at all? Let's start with you, Ray. Well, being slightly of the older generation, I I haven't (laughs) progressed very much in the emoji stage. It it wasn't that many years ago, if I'm honest, that my kids corrected me when I was calling them (laughs) M-Joys. Um, but nonetheless, as my social media presence is mainly consists around dad jokes and funny cat videos, I like the laughing with until you cry emoji. That tends to be my yeah, I love it. And favorite. in fact, I'd like to propose a that we all sign something that gets it changed to M Joys. I think that's a much nicer name anyway, because that's what it brings everybody, right? How about you, Dan? What's your most used? You've probably got a few more you use, I reckon, on a daily basis. Yeah. Absolutely. And it depends which application it's in. So if it's mobile, uh, it's either the, probably the laugh until you cry emoji or the, the duck emoji. Right. Um, for no particular reason, just <laughs> like ducks. Yep. Um, but if it's on Slack, it's got to be our custom AOLF logo. Yep. Or cat jam. Yep. So. How cool is it being able to upload anything as your, like another emoji into Slack? It's a cool little feature, isn't it? Where you can add those. I've actually bothered to find the, the moving ones. So we've got some dancing ones and all sorts of stuff that we've put into Slack. I really love that. We've got off track there. Sorry, folks. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> now, if you had to delete all of the apps off your smartphone and you're only allowed to keep three, Ray, which three would you keep? All right. Um, <laughs> probably my main social is Facebook, and I do tend to enjoy that. Again, probably showing yep. my age, but nonetheless. Um, my Slack app, because that's how I communicate with my team. Yep. Um, and the most important app of all is Air Wealth. Because I like to, like, right. to keep track of my family wealth. 
well, of course. <laughs> I couldn't. I shouldn't expect any different, which puts a great deal of pressure on Dan because we're about to ask him the same question. So what would your answer be? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so my, my main uh, social media of choice is Instagram. Um, I had to already remove TikTok because that's a rabbit hole that yep. is never ending. Yep. Um, the second one would probably be uh, Facebook as well. Actually, I'm going to scratch that one off and uh, say Spotify. Yeah. I love my music. Um, and then the final one has to be Air Wealth. Uh, just good to have a, an understanding of where all of your net worth is. <laughs> nice. No. Despite it being- That was close. Get a school. <laughs> I'm super glad we, we got some agreement on that. There could have been – exactly, there could have been tears before we even got started. Fantastic. All righty, let's dive into Airwell, shall we? So, help me get a sense of where it sort of sits in the tech space, sort of what category does it fall under, and is there any other tools that generally you're lined up next to, even if it's not compared against, like it's sort of grouped amongst? Yeah, um, I might kick that off. Uh, we don't see this – strictly being in the advice space insofar as it's not about providing advice. It's not a portfolio reporting tool. It's not um, a, a financial planning tool. It's We see it as a value-added tool that intermediaries can provide to their clients. We've targeted it primarily at um, high net worth families and it's all about being a, 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 a register for wealth. Right. And, you know, traditional investments typically only represent about a third of high net worth families' wealth. Um, so, you know, that's where we sort of see it slotting as a, yep. a value-added tool. But by providing that to the family with um, uh, the ability to have multiple members of the family access and be able to see and be able to use that information, we think it's a really good way of providing a much greater engagement and it's all, you know, white labelled, etc. So does that mean that, that is there? Oh, so does sorry. that mean that groups like you know accountants? So, so it's generally like anybody that sort of, um, you know, working with these families would benefit from that. Well, their clients would benefit from the tool, and so that's what you're seeing is is not just advisors. It's all sorts of other players. Maybe it's you know stockbrokers or whoever whoever sort of engages with those families on a sort of more regular basis. Is that fair? That's absolutely fair, and and in fact. Um, we've taken to, you know, providing um, native integration for those uh, organisations who do hold investments and do hold um, any consolidated positions to be able to natively integrate through to Air Wealth, but then that gives the family the ability to bring other assets in. Yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. So now then – and. I'm, I'm curious in terms of where this all started because I'm betting given this is a re- very, well, very new <laughs> app to market um, at moments even, then, you know, what triggered this? So what was the initial problem it was solving? Was it one that you had or your business had? Like where did it all start that caused you to realise that actually there's more people that need this type of tool um, out there in the market? Yeah, um, th- this all started – Really about three years ago when, when I had to be executor for my, my old dad's estate. He didn't have very much, but what he had was awfully hard to find. Um, <laughs> we, we were going through scraps of paper and didn't realise that he ever had shares when we found an old NIB share certificate and then we didn't realise he banked with other banks and um, and so it went on and it actually it struck me at the time, you know, I've been... I've been far luckier than my old dad was and uh, Mm -hmm. my personal estate would be much more complex to sort. I'm generally not a particularly organised person. So (laughs) what what I was really looking was a central place where I could keep track of the assets that I hold and liabilities, um, keep a central vault and help me be organised on a daily basis and that's that's where that sort of come from. Um, Yeah, okay. we, We also looked at the market. And, you know, generally high net worth advice groups, including my own, uh, provides sterling uh, support around my investments. But the fact is that only represents, on average, for high net worth families, about one third of their assets they hold. Right. And we wanted something that encapsulated all of it. We also wanted something that went across different 
um, wealth holding entities, family trusts, super, self made super, right. um, investment companies, etc. Yeah, okay. Which makes a lot of sense. And I think um, one of the questions that that I've got about this then because I'm betting it would come up for people is, and Dan, I'd be curious on your take on this, is so there'll be people that will be really comfortable with this, think it's the best thing ever because they can put it all in there, all the info, all the paper. Like I can just see it. would be great, this, this vault and this font of information. And yes, I want, you know, the adult kids, they can see in, so therefore if they need access. There'll be some people that might want it all there but won't necessarily want the kids act to see it all initially. Like, how how are you guys imagining that certain families would handle that? Because it's got to come up, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, one of the main things that we've focused on, actually. So we have uh, different user types for different levels of permission currently, and so they they can include uh, the primary controller or alternate controllers of a family. Right. Um, however, they can also be read-only access and currently we're creating a default to privacy mode so you can't actually see any of the numbers yep. uh, and the financial figures. However, um, you can see what the assets are, sure. which is a good starting point. Um, but we also have uh, estate executives as a user type so they can gain access upon death of the primary controller. Yep. Um, or, yeah, we've got a, a wide range of those user types to to help deal with that level of permissions. Yeah, because it's an it's look, it's such a difficult. Well, none nobody talks about this stuff, right? For starters, right? So very few families are having open conversations about these things, and therefore the default is avoidance. You know, that's what we all do about something that's difficult to talk about. We avoid. Um, and not realizing that, like you say, even if not being able to see the dollars, even if it's just the list of items, the ease even before death, the ease for like a power of attorney situation, if you're trying to, you know, yeah. something's happened and they can no longer manage their situation, trying to get to the bottom of those details is like pulling teeth. It's horrendous. And some people even end up quitting work for a period of time, don't they? Just because the task is so hard and is so big. So, having something that Absolutely. sort of acknowledges those stages and and that this doesn't need to be an all, you know, oh, look, here it all is and, you know, <laughs> cause all sorts of conversations. Maybe they weren't ready for it. At least it's a starting point. I think that's powerful to understand that this is a bit of a journey um, for families to go on. It's interesting you say that because the first time I showed somebody from an, from an executor, trustee executor company, um, the first thing they noted was we, we also keep a um, list of family contacts and what roles they fulfil for either assets or affiliates of the family. And they went, that would be a huge step forward just because often we have to do this and we don't even know who the lawyer or the accountant are. Right. And, you know, I think, I think yep. that sort of stuff is that daily, very, very useful, uh, not necessarily um, glossy and shiny, but really useful sort of features. That we it is, isn't it? Else. Yeah, and it's so interesting that the um – you know, the devil is in the detail and when we're talking detail, it's in the minutiae of the administration, isn't it? It's just like all those little things that, that we all hold in our brains for our own situations, not recognizing that that's not particularly useful <laughs> to everybody else involved. That becomes very difficult to get access to. Um, and, and the old, I mean, it's got even worse now. I mean, the old days, like you just said, uh, Ray, you'd, you'd like dig through the paperwork. There'd just be a pile of files or, or some corner with, you know, paperwork in and you could dig through it. That's much harder now, right? I mean, even just getting access to the emails or wherever everything digitally is going to be, that's not easy. You know, that in itself could be a barrier. So, you know, it's an interesting thing to at least give some forethought to that uh, so that people can sort of transition into that. So, let's talk then, clearly, primary users are the um, uh, customer client and their, like the, the individual and, and their family members. Like you say, I'm guessing then, is there secondary users, therefore, that can be the solicitor or the other, like, the, can they actually be a user of, or is it more likely they're noted as just contact details as somebody? Yeah, the... I guess we we we've targeted obviously high net worth families. So uh, as at our initial as our initial launch, mm. um, and, and as you say, we sort of see it, it's an interesting dynamic. I think from people who are just high net worth families to people that are very very ultra high net worth families, <laughs> um, and you know, as, as soon as you, I, I think there's a lot of self service at the low end of that wealth. Um, yep. Spectrum, yep. and 
you know, as you go up and into sort of family office type levels, that's when we, we've catered for sort of administration, being an appointed administrator right. um, as, as a user of Air Wealth. Yeah. Um, I, th- I, th- I think, as you rightly said earlier, we've got this whole concept of, um, you know, trusted family members and, um, and, you know, whilst we've got that concept of, you know, you can appoint read-only users, then, you know, it, it, it's, it's like a big button and not everyone's black or white, not everyone's good or evil. Sure. Um, and we're actually, we're actually working with um, an, an enterprise client initially about actually putting in a whole bunch more of slicing and dicing criteria. So yep. be able to say, yes, you can see my investments, my bank accounts, but not my collectibles or you, you, right. you know, being able to put a finer grain security into that. But I guess the secondary uses are definitely those other appointed viewers or accesses of the family information. And that can include the advice. Um, yep. The, the advisor, right? Um, yeah. So, and, and in that respect, we don't differentiate. We, we have different user types. But we sure. Limit, and it's controlled by the family. Yeah. So the family controls who they want to see. And in fact, even, you know, part of this important security is right massive on this. Yes. But, you know, we can't even see the data. So we, we've built it on what we call a zero knowledge architecture so that not even we can see it. So it literally is in the hand of the controllers of the family as to who can see what. Perfect. And it's, I mean, merely um, having to actually pull together the information and then decide on access. Like all of those things are a great framework for acknowledging people's roles. I mean, there's some, you know, in a different space, we're not sort of, you know, high net wealth necessarily, um, although um, for our niche, but we're working hard to engage with sort of that Gen X chief family officer, you know, that person that sort of coordinates everybody and and is starting to worry about mum and dad and what they're doing in retirement, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, these people do have a whole lot of responsibility and very little resources, you know, at their disposal. And so, you know, similarly for what you're talking there is, is you know, the bigger end, then it makes such a sense to just force them to think that through. You know, and so that the parents can go, all right, well, who do we want to, you know, have access and why? And we're going to have to be able to tell them that. Like we, like it forces, I think, that sort of conversation and engagement, which not ne- necessarily everybody has had, you know, and, and they might have just left it assumed. They might have just assumed people know that we would want so and so to be the one that's doing this. It's like, no. <laughs> the, it, yep. it's, there's been some really good research and it, it sort of shows that. Mums and dads don't want to talk about death because they don't think it's about to happen. And the kids yeah. don't want to talk about it because it sounds like they're being greedy. Yes. Uh, that, that they're you know, money grabbing. And, and, but at the end of the day, this is all about um, you know, having it documented. And that's the first step of any um, transfer plan is to have it yeah. documented. And we, we, you know, we've built Air Wealth, though, not – on a basis of we're not focused on death. We're actually trying to make it really useful while you're still kicking. And yep. that's, I think, an important note. Yeah, absolutely. So then, I mean, interestingly, um, I could see an opportunity for advisors to see this as more almost an added value. You know, they could introduce their clients to this to sort of bring their clients to the next level of organization, the next level of – because it's that proactive thinking, isn't it? Like it's saying, look, we get that you don't want to really think about these things and maybe you've gone to the solicitor and done the wills and all sorts of other legal documents. That's great, but there's more to it than that. You know, there's there's a communication exercise that's going to need to happen. Um, let's get that started. So I think that to me is an interesting engagement concept, particularly given, and we laughed as we were started, you know, the intergenerational wealth transfer, which is, you know, a, a, a keyword search that clearly is applying to almost every, to every second article in our industry at the moment. But it's true. I mean, it's not going to be long before the dollars transferred each year for intergenerational wealth transfer will be bigger than the super guarantee comp- contributions of, for that year for the nation. You know, like it's this, there's, these are not small dollars. So I think um, something like this that gives you a way to add value, connect with different generations. Those things are good. Like that's powerful. You know, it's not Absolutely. just saying, hey, we should talk to the kids. 
It's just saying, here's yeah. a tool that's fantastic. It's going to add value to you. And naturally, why don't we facilitate some conversations, say, with your adult children? Completely. And it's also a white labeled solution. So whichever sponsoring organization decides to implement Airwealth, uh, it'll be natively branded with their logo and brand colors. So that, that regular engagement is also engaging with the advisor's branding, um, rather than just us as a third party. Uh, so hopefully that helps reduce that client retention of around 30% upon inheritance of money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And now just to remind me, is this a intended to be a mobile app? Is it a web, you know, a sort of uh, desktop based? Like what's what's the intention? Like what's the best way to utilize it? And what are the different ways, you know, a consumer could, could um, utilize the tool? Yeah, it's, it's um, we've implemented this as a, PWA, so it's a progressive web app, which means it yep. can sit on your on the desktop of your phone or your iPad. Um, yep. You can do virtually virtually everything on on the mobile. So yep. I use AirWealth ninety percent of the time on my mobile. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of setup things that. Um, we prefer to use a web screen, which is setting up some of the relationships between family right. entities yeah. and um, some of the connection to um, external banking or um, investment providers. So there's a couple of things that are set up on day one right. on, on a desktop, on a but the it, it, PC. iPad works fine. iPad okay. works fine as well. But when you're on mobile, everything else is is able to be done from the mobile. I mean, we when we built this, I, you know, I always said to my developer team when we when I want to walk up to something, take a picture of it, and onboard it. It's got to be that easy. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, obviously, we're talking outside of the traditional assets, but you know, yeah. um, we've got to onboard it. It's got to be mobile. It's got to be. Um, as, as automated as possible around valuations and things like that. So. Well, and and look, it's interesting you say that. I've um I've got somebody I know a good friend of mine who um has worked previously for a family um who were in the way at the top end of this scale. Um, and one of the senior family members passed away and, and one of her responsibilities was to go down into the wine cellar, right? And this is somebody who doesn't drink wine. So the poor thing had to sit there in this dark, dingy part of the, the home and take photos of all, cause, cause they'd never really done a recent, you know, assessment or collation of all of that. And then where does that go and, and how does it get saved and collated? And like, it's because it's something you could actually, I'm betting you could do over time too. If there was something that was quite detailed like that, you could just go, you know, every time we go down there on the weekend, we'll just do some more of them. So we've captured them or whatever. You know, this is, if you've got a place to put it, then that just makes it that much easier to start collating that information. Yeah. That onboarding of information is really important. Yeah. Um, do you want to explain what we do to help onboarding death? Absolutely. So, uh, when we are initially onboarding, we'll have a, a native link to the advisor's back office software. Um, so, whether that be premium, X plan, so we'll build out that integration to have uh, regular valuations fetched yep. um, to, to help automate that process. Uh, Second step would be uh, allowing families to link into a world of banking and investment products through uh, one of our partners. Mm-hmm. And so, because we're ISO 27001 certified, we're able to benefit from the open banking protocols. Um, so, we can get those native links to uh, all of the op- – about 900 um, different – financial institutions okay. in Australia. Okay. Um, and any of those non-traditional assets, uh, we can bulk import. Okay. So, whether they be your collection of watches, records, wine, for, for instance, um, yeah, we, we create a, a, an Excel spreadsheet okay. to help aid that. Beautiful. Okay. Because that's the one thing that um, – has got to be a direct link, right? It's is the further up the wealth sort of chain or, or mountain you go, the more likely there are to be more unusual assets, right? So it's the, the less simple and vanilla things go. There's some collection of whatever it'll be, and it'll be something you never would have thought somebody could collect, but 
there'll be that and it will have inherent value. Um, and so, you know, it's an important part of, of pulling all the information together. So open banking, fantastic. Um, and that's, of course, I'm, well, I'm imagining that's just going to get better and better as, as it becomes more and more utilized and, and a given. Um, so that's fantastic. Is there any other, even down the track integrations you're expecting either direction? You know, so that then I guess given it's from the consumer's perspective, then most of those will be focused on the, the consumer rather than the advisor. Is that a fair assumption in terms of integrations? Um, yeah. We, we, um, we, we're currently building an interface to zero. Yep. And, and we expect to do mild after yep. that. Um, and the whole idea is to be able to pull in your balance sheet from – an accounting package yeah, and, okay. and have it represented on a daily basis. Uh, we think at some point in the future will also go the other way. So your investment portfolios can be reflected back into my um, Yeah, okay. But not working on that at the moment. Um, we've we've got uh, f- f- for those you know investment portfolios which you know uh, are not covered by the current um, integration. We've got. Uh, if you like a generic uh, format that you can bring investment yep. portfolio in on, but we see that we will build a number of specifics um, for, for, for dedicated formats on an yeah. as-needed basis, and you know we, we, what we're, we're trying to form relationships at the moment with the likes of um, um, you know back offers for VC funds. For yep. example, so you can not only pull through, you know, quarterly valuations when they do value, values, but but also things like the, um, uh, you know, future commitments. Yep. And all that kind of information to to assist because, you know, from what we're seeing is, you know, a lot more wealthy families are investing in private equity. Yeah. Funds and things like understanding your total combined future commitment of cash is yeah. this sort of important feature. So we've got a lot of integration. We've got – that's funny. We, we've gone live. We've got a whole bunch of functionality, but we've actually got um, a, a future features list as long as my arm that we, we're working to. I bet. And I bet part of it is also um, getting more and more people onto it so that then you can work out, you know, either what isn't on the list or what sh- what you'll – you know, juggle like what will you move forward and and change the order of because of demand or interest. Um, you know, that's that's always the case when you've got something that's relatively new. In terms of then that development path, um, you know, what do you see? Clearly, you've got a list, and they'll you know that'll be well. I hate to take to tell you, but it'll be perpetual. <laughs> Having spoken to so many tech providers, it's clear it's never ending. You're constantly developing it. I'm a bit curious, though, about the sort of more blue sky future for air wealth. Like, is there anywhere that you're thinking, well, as we, as we get further, we get more users, you know, we get more take up, you know, it'll be interesting to see if we can take it to a, you know, another place or a different market. Is there anything like that in the future that you, you throwing around as ideas? So firstly, we, you know, by virtue of the fact we're not getting transactional, we're not getting tax, we're not domestic in nature. Uh, we see this as being a global product. So we, right. we're, we're multi-currency. We support all the currencies, all the stock exchanges of the world, um, all the cryptos, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so what, what what we do think in the future is, you know, what firstly we massively – Anybody that comes onto this platform, I, I said before, security is mm. of, of utmost importance. And likewise, we don't want to be hammering them with advertising. So, so there's none of that. But I think as a community, yeah. as a as a community, I would like to have um, subscription channels. I call it. So right. you know, potentially, if 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 I as a user of Air Wealth want, am interested in capital raisings. Right. That, that there could be a subscription channel that I could subscribe to to see. Capital to get rates. updates. Yeah. Yep. Yep. If, you know, I could see there being, you know, offers of, you know, potentially if I'm into classic cars and I want to publish a car into the community without actually being advertised publicly, I think yep. I think there's a lot of areas like that. Um, you know, we, as a general principle, what we're talking about within Air Wealth is a, a digital uh, balance sheet. Yep. 
and I see, you know, the ability to share your balance sheet with a loan provider. Right. You know, to be able to share a portion of assets with an insurer. You know, yep. I'd like a so, – so I, I see this as being, um, you know, we, we maintain that sovereignty at the end of the day will sit with the families and mm. that they'll have uh, a lot more use from, you know, how they how they use their balance sheet and hopefully take a lot of that manual process out of a whole bunch of processes right throughout their life. Absolutely. And it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting concept, the sort of uh, – streaming for a bit of expression of you know subscription to or something you're interested in right because um and and not every advisor will be in that sort of game and we certainly aren't for our clients but I do know people that for example some of them love funding films right they love that you know they they know nothing about it right clearly but they love that concept and so want to have something that just keeps them up to date on what's going on what are the new opportunities what are the you know and it's not just on a based on somebody being able to get through to them, it's something that could be more of, you know, streamed of information and opportunities and updates. You know, it's an interesting concept to that is quite unique, but certainly for, you know, the market you're talking about, I think could be quite um, valuable and, and interesting to them for sure. Yep. So then, okay, well, I'm going to – the regular audience, and I think actually, Ray, you mentioned this when we were running through the questions that normally I'd be saying, "Hey, you know, what are the um, what are the ninja users doing with the tool?" It's probably a little early to suggest that there's. <laughs> I'd like to think that I'm the only ninja user. <laughs> right, exactly. We're talking to the ninja user here, folks. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but is there any of the features that you think? And actually, Dan, I'm curious on your take on this. So, as a for a younger generation, do you see that there's going to be features you guys are going to have to develop that will appeal differently to the different generations? Do you see that as being something that's maybe it's the way things are represented, the way they're provided or anything like that, that you're just going to have to have that, con- you know, that sort of lens that, that covers Absolutely. different generations? Yeah, yeah. So, with that, um, majority of the team is uh, in in their 20s right. who have developed this, apart from a few notable exceptions. Yep. Um, okay. And so, <laughs> <laughs> only just out of your twenties, right? Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, well, just sounds, out. Just. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And so they've all developed it with the mindset to appeal to the next generation primarily. So it's a super user friendly application that isn't the traditional uh, financial app. Yep. Meaning that it is all just numbers and like in line. Yes. It's it's very user friendly. It's UI focused. And so, I think it's already been built with a lot of those features yeah, okay. inbuilt, but there's also a bunch of intelligent tech in there that we're using. So, including start with a photo, which uses AI to recognize what asset type you've just taken a photo of. Nice. And puts you through the onboarding. Okay. Um, we're also working on one for onboard- onboarding of a car. Uh, it'll pre-fill the registration number and then fill out all the details of that car. Okay, cool. As well. Um, we've also got a wealth calendar that provides uh, important financial events uh, and indicates that to the end user. So, these can include revaluations, insurance renewal, vesting dates in private equity. Uh, but these also can be modified and, and created by the user for those those non-traditional assets. Yeah. So, if you need to get your watch serviced, your, your car's register is coming up. Yeah, uh, we're building that all out of that. for that, <laughs> and it's an interesting concept. The timing thing is really interesting because I many years ago we're talking <clears throat> like a couple of decades ago. Um, I did some work for a company that was owned by a large, a wealthy family, um, very very wealthy. And what was interesting was how important dividend dates when you when you own <laughs> a business and that's generating wonderful income. Suddenly, the dates dividends get paid become very real because that's cash flow, man. This is not like sure they might have a job that pays you know some sort of salary, but the real money for them in cash is on these dividend payment dates. And so they became, you know, in bold, laminated on the wall type of dates to be aware of. So it makes sense that that would be another way to ensure that everybody's on the same page and, you know, we're all, and we're not, you know, you're not getting phone calls perhaps you don't need to have that can get a bit angsty. If there's an app that can just answer those questions, then it's not creating tension or, you know, like adding that's unnecessary. It's just an administrating 
you know, bit of information. So that's quite powerful, I think. And, and that's, I think, one of the bits that's engaging, right, having all of that information in your wealth calendar. Um, what, one of our future um, developments is to actually just extend that out to integrate with your own Google Calendar or your Outlook Calendar yeah. or whatever. But, you know, we, we think that sort of push notification that you get through Air Wealth is actually quite important way of engaging and ensuring, again, that that hero brand shows up um, on, a, on a daily basis to the users. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's an interesting concept, you know, designing it, like you're saying, Dan, designing it from the sort of the next gen's perspective to me makes that a wonderful opportunity from, for advisors that haven't yet tapped into that generation because you're not – um, telling the parents or engaging with the parents, trying to convince them to engage with the next gen. If you've got something you know will be valuable, but also is not, they're not going to balk at, um, then that. That's an ease in to that transition um, that I think will make a big difference. It's something we're all going to struggle to face is the entire financial services environment is tailored really for boomers and Gen X, right? It's sort of all built for what we're happy to put up with, which potentially hasn't been quite good enough in a communication sense, right? So, so the fact that this is really coming from, um, you know, the next generation of what they, what they're used to, what they're used to, the way they're used to engaging with things, that's powerful because it's taking away another friction point. You know, another yep. reason people won't use this. Is there anything we've missed in terms of the tool or what it's able to do? Yeah. Um, look, you know, we, we've talked about the contacts, the wealth calendar, the, the you know, the document vault's massively important for me. And, yeah. and um, we, we've talked about the benefits to the family themselves. There's actually a big benefit. I think to the advisors of the family who, who have access to view this because I mean I I recant on my own position and I I did a balance sheet in two thousand and seven and I don't think I've really been asked for a balance sheet since. Right. So so I, I think to myself, well, um, you know, I, I shouldn't be put in uh, say property within my portfolio because I've bought property since 2007. Yeah, so I was saying the benefit to the advisors. Um, and, you know, I think it's really useful to be able to get access to actually the overall asset allocation for a family, even including the assets that they don't know about as well as the assets they do know about. Because I think at the end of the day, that gives a basis on which better advice can be given. Um the, the other thing for me about engagement is as much as everybody loves investments, what people are actually really engaged with are their passion investments, yeah. their items of collectible, their wine or their artwork or their jewellery or their watches. Yeah. And actually by intermelding the traditional and the passion investments together, that is actually what creates um, – another level of engagement that we perhaps will never see with just just giving uh, financial numbers. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's – I think more of the tools we're going to be using with clients or for clients will be – Consumer centric, because that's what you're really saying is it's about what they value, what they're interested in. And we just happen to be party to that. You know, like it's, we're sort of ancillary. And I think it's an important shift, to be honest, in attitude for all of us. And of course, by knowing what your clients' passion investments are, it, it actually lets you engage with them in a, a more natural way for them as well. Yes. I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Air Wealth, then the website link is in the episode show notes. I've also included Ray and Dan's LinkedIn details, so I'm sure they'd be happy for you to just reach out and give them a bit of a nudge and uh, they can arrange a demo for you. Thank you so much for joining us here today, gents, sharing how Air Wealth can contribute to this intergenerational wealth transfer challenge we've all got and actually providing a solution. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, for really Appreciate your time as well. I appreciate it. So, you definitely won't be a current user of AirWealth, I'm betting, uh, listener, because this is a brand new app to market, um, but 
Really curious on your take, um, whether you think that's the sort of thing you could fold in for your clients, how you might do that, what you'd be looking for. Um, please be sure to share any of that feedback on the Ensemble Community platform. Um, I'd be really interested in your take because I think, um, you know, these early access apps, we can really shape um, how they evolve over time by the feedback we can give them and the insights. And each of us look at these things quite differently. So, you know, it's fantastic to be able to give them those, um, those you know, insights and and even ideas for what might be valuable. In terms of my thoughts, I think, you know, I mean, we joked about the whole intergenerational wealth transfer, but it's a real thing. It is coming uh, and it's going to be significant. And for many practices, um, they will have a heavily weighted boomer or maybe Gen X based uh, business. And so having a constructive and helpful way to uh, connect with the broader members of the family and therefore move on to potentially adding value to them too. Um, I think, you know, we really need to need to seriously consider the options and, What's interesting about this is if you do it from a position of helpful, you know, being helpful and really understanding what challenges they're facing, right? Asking the question, you know, seeing down a group, do market research sessions. I've done them recently where I've had a number of people in our niche that we're looking at serving and I've had them just on a, a Zoom or Google Meet call, five or six maybe, and rather than sort of really too narrowly focusing on the questions from a money basis. It's more like, what's keeping you up at night? What's frustrating you? What are you dealing with that means you just can't chill out and relax and think about the future, right? Try and get to the bottom of what the the initial blockages are. Uh, And that's going to really help you define what tools, partnerships, apps, you know, consultancy um, programs, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, courses, you know, there's going to be all sorts of things that you could add value to that, um, by tailoring it to the problem they're solving right now will mean you're there when that problem's solved and they've got the bandwidth and the wherewithal to think about the future, right? And that then you can lean into the sort of more traditional parts of advice. So, you know, I think the more we can, can we can really get creative about the way we can help, then I think, you know, we're going to become um, just that guru, that person that they instinctively trust and want to lean on, even, even just provide updates of the challenges they're facing, you know, deal, but it's that really trusted partner um, that I know that we all feel we are for our clients and, and almost certainly are, but I think we can take that and and transition that to their adult kids as well. I think there's a, a wonderful um, connective sort of tissue we can become for them by providing solutions that help with that and even help them create a better connection with their adult kids. So I'd love to hear what you think though in this respect. So please uh, reach out. You can also, um, in, the, in the episode show notes, there's a link there where you can even send me a little audio question or feedback. So I'd love to hear from you if that's the case. Now we have come to that time. It's curiosity corner time, folks. And, you know, we need to keep on building this avid curiosity. We need to make sure we're on our journey to become bionic advisors. So today's website that I want you to take a look at is called Forgotify. Now, this is not for business, right? This is for you as super wonderful, awesome human beings that you are. You can find it at forgotify.com, F-O-R-G-O-T-I-F-Y.com. And basically their premise is that millions of songs on Spotify have been forgotten, right? Because we all get these playlists we like, and then it, it you know, suggests things that you'll like that are tan- tangential to that, but it doesn't really encourage the random discovery of music or even the music that you haven't heard for years and years and years and years and years, right? So this actually is a tool that gives new life to music that's gone undiscovered for some time in Spotify. And so it's a that website, you just go on, you click on start listening, and it just brings up a song you can listen to and you can go, oh, that's pretty cool. Do I like it? Do I want to add it to my Spotify feed? So it's not living quite in Spotify as much as Spotify is the way within which they're playing these um, these tracks for you. And it just lets you discover new or very old that you haven't heard for some time um, or maybe not so old, but it just sort of got drowned out by something else, um, music. And I love this as a really 
simple frustration. Um, it's letting you stretch your brain, your imagination, listen to something a bit different, get those neural pathways working. So I'd love you to give it a whack and see if there's something you've you've discovered that you really enjoyed. If there was some music you loved um, that you hadn't heard of before or not for quite some time, hey, send it through to me. I'd love to hear it myself um, so that we can all sort of broaden our perspectives that bit more. Well, that's all we've got for this week, folks. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you're getting that sort of tech overwhelm, you know, and you sort of wonder if in fact you need to streamline your tech rather than take on more apps in your business, then hey, give your dealer group a nudge, get them to reach out to me or feel free to reach out myself yourself and uh, connect me with the right person. Um, I've been doing sessions and workshops at conferences around the paradox of advice tech abundance and all the cho- you know choices we have versus the potential drawbacks of all of these choices and how advice tech minimalism might work for you, in fact, and, you know, what habits we can build to keep your advice process humming from a tech perspective. So if that sounds interesting, uh, then please don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD, that's P-E-I-T-A-M-D, and I'd love to have a chat. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.